Good afternoon and welcome to today's Lunch and Learn webinar for the Iowa Pediatric Mental Health Collaborative, Adolescent Substance Use, Assessment and Referral to Treatment, presented by Dr. Alex Dalmakov. My name is Kathy Dixon and I'll be moderating the session today. I'll cover a few housekeeping announcements before we get started. The webinar will be recorded and made available for viewing on our YouTube channel. The link will be shared in the follow-up email after the session. Following the presentation, we'll have time for questions. Please use the Q&A feature in the webinar toolbar to submit your questions, and we'll cover as many as time allows. Instructions for how to claim credit will be uploaded to the chat section, and this information will also be sent in the follow-up email. So without further delay, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Alex Selmakov. Dr. Selmakov is a psychiatric nurse practitioner who graduated with a Doctor of nurse pra Nursing Practice from the University of Minnesota in 2023. Prior to that, she worked for the Minnesota University Hospital as an inpatient psychiatric nurse on the Child Adolescent Intensive, the Dual Mental Health Substance Use Disorder Unit, and Young Adult Unit for five years. While obtaining her doctorate, Dr. Stolmikoff served as a psychiatric clinical instructor for the University of Minnesota School, um, School of Nursing. Most of Dr. Stolmikoff's DNP rotations were completed in the University of Minnesota Hospital on the child intensive and young adult units, while most of her group therapy hours were completed at a dual adolescent residential site that served court-ordered teen boys. Dr. Stalmakov noticed noted the increasing harm from fentanyl use in teens and lacking services for them. This led her to pursue the addiction fellowship with the University of Iowa. Her goal is to implement her addiction and child psych training to fill these current care gaps. So thank you, Dr. Stalmakov. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much for such a wonderful introduction. Um, hello, everybody. Once again, I am Alex Stomakov. I'm a psychiatric nurse practitioner who is functioning as a current addiction psychiatry fellow with the University Addiction Recovery Collaborative. Uh, so we can get started here. Um, I don't have any official disclosure, so I don't have any financial interests or relationships that would be commercial interests that would create a bias in me giving this presentation today. Um, that said, I do have things in my background, as already discussed, um, in just my practice as a nurse and my current practice as a nurse practitioner that will certainly influence my perspective and how I give this presentation today. Um, I am deeply passionate about the child adolescent psychiatry population. I'm equally as passionate about um, the population of those with substance use disorders. As I said, I'm a current fellow um, with the University Addiction Recovery Collaborative. So my wonderful leaders and mentors include Dr. Allison Lynch and Dr. Andrew Weber. Um, I also want to give credit to Dr. Hannah Stevens, who is the Director of Child Adolescent Psychiatry, who told me about this um, opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, I have rotated in the Child Adolescent Psych Clinic as an NP. I also rotate in the dual IOP step program in Cedar Rapids. And I do currently see some teenagers in the MAC clinic as well. So just want to keep in mind that I'm going to use a lot of person-centered language. Um, if you ever hear me say SUDs, I'm referring to substance use disorders, you know, no longer using terms like abuse, but misuse and substance use, that sort of thing. And just being mindful that in, in all of our audience here today, that a lot of us probably either know someone or maybe even personally have been touched by addictions or substance use histories. And I want to be really mindful about that as we talk about this today. I want to also give reference to PCSS or the Provider Clinical Support Services. So some of my slides will go through are um, pulled from that specific module on substance use and adolescent populations. Um, PCSS is a specific SAMHSA funded organization. It's an online website I'll show in a second here. It is a part of um, that DEA requirement. So since we're moving the X waiver, there's now the requirement to do the eight hours of training to be able to um, be um, able to prescribe addiction treatment and specifically treatment for OB use disorder. And so um, I did pull some slides from there, but that said, I added my own details and um, some other things as well. Here is that PCSS reference. I want everybody to be aware about this wonderful, wonderful website. I want to reiterate that it's free, um, that you can go in not only to find training and modules that are very helpful, anything related to addiction and specifically for resources on um, treating opioid use disorder. There is that, um, there's also a section on mentoring. And so I just kind of circled that there that you can go in and actually request your own mentor if interested. 
Okay, so I'm going to do my best to cover all of these topics in 50 minutes today. Please give me grace. And I apologize if I'm talking a little quickly, but I want to make sure we get through all of these things. Um, topics we'll go through is we'll first talk about specific trends and what adolescent substance use is looking like. Then we'll talk about neurobiology in this population and, you know, how adolescents might be more prone to substance use based behaviors and risk for STDs. Um, we'll talk a bit about cannabis specifically. And then I want to be mindful of my audience today as well, that um, while I acknowledge that some of you might not be working in the very specialized realm that I do, um, you will still probably encounter these things and want to know how to screen and then refer if we run into it and to know when something is concerning, what to do next. Um, so we'll talk a bit about screening tools in the referral process. And lastly, I'll go over treatment options, not necessarily expecting anyone's going to master um, medication treatment for this today, but just to know enough to be able to provide some explanation and education to someone who might be interested if you are going to make that referral process. So my hope is by the end of our presentation today, you'll be able to understand how brain development can increase STD risk in adolescents. Um, to be able to differentiate medicinal and helpful versus harmful impacts of cannabis, apply a brief screening tool to assess for adolescent substance use disorders, and then be able to identify when to refer an adolescent to SUD treatment or resources, and be able to briefly just list those available treatment options. So next thing is really important to mention why we must talk about this. And I don't think it's a question of if we should, but more of a why we must. Um, I honestly think of primary care providers, especially those of you, anyone who works with this population, have such a great opportunity to deeply implement preventative health care in ways that I might not be able to. Uh, I acknowledge that sometimes when I see the population I do, whether it's in the psychiatric clinic or in the MAC clinic, Unfortunately, sometimes we're pretty deep into our use disorder or maybe we're pretty far down the rope of whatever we've been struggling with. However, anyone in primary care, I view you more as the gatekeepers, meaning that you're probably better able to filter through and see um, whether something's beginning before it becomes a problem or something concerning is happening to then catch it before it becomes really pervasive and severe. And of course, it's really hard to talk about substance use, especially nowadays, without discussing the current crisis of fentanyl. Um, acknowledging that fentanyl contamination and drug supplies is now the rule and not the exception. Um, as you're all aware, I do come from our neighboring state of Minnesota, where we have seen a scary increase in fentanyl contamination and substances, which has led to overdose deaths in a lot of um, adolescents in our inner city areas which as I put in this news report, we're seeing this in suburb areas as well. Um, this news report is just speaking to that really um, elevated increase in fentanyl they're seizing in drug supplies in Minnesota. And then I also found a recent news report about Des Moines parents here in Iowa warning about fentanyl that led to the death of their son. And so as we're gonna transition and talk about statistics next of adolescent substance use and the harms, I want to make sure we're thinking that these aren't just numbers, but these are children, these are adolescents. Um, and I kind of want to pose these rhetorical questions to think about as we go through here, which is, you know, fentanyl poisoning. How much is that involved in the harms that we're seeing in the current adolescent substance use behaviors? When did these adolescents, when did their substance use start? Uh, when did their treatment start, if they ever received any substance use treatment? And I wonder how many doctors they saw before these outcomes had occurred. And that's not by any means to point fingers, and it's definitely to keep myself accountable as well, but just to remember how important prevention and screening really is. Okay, so next, let's talk about those trends. Uh, if no one is aware of this survey, I want to just talk about it briefly here. So Monitoring the Future Survey is this really wonderful, deeply encompassing longitudinal survey that has been implemented through the National Institute of Drug Abuse, um, NIDA, who is partnered with the University of Michigan. And from the 70s up until today, they have been administering um, behavioral-based surveys to 12th graders across the nation. Um, they've surveyed 50,000 uh, in this age group, and they do it every two to five years in kind of a cohort pattern. In the 90s, they added in eighth and 10th graders. And so from the 90s up until today, we've been tracking trends of um, substance use behavior, sexual health behaviors, and different things pertaining to mental health. So if I'm ever curious of what's happening in adolescence with different subjects, I like to refer to this survey. You can certainly look at my references to look into it if interested. It's very useful. 
What I specifically honed in here was um, more recently what we were seeing. So in 2018, we saw a very dramatic increase in substance use specific to vaping and specific to not only nicotine products, but um, marijuana in 17 and 19 year olds. And this use had increased three times for grades 8, 10 and 12. So a very significant increase in 2018. Um, substance use did overall decline in 2020 and remained luckily stable on those lower levels into 2023. I think this speaks a lot to with the quarantining, how much exposure and access to substances really influences use in this population. All of that said, though, even with the decline in substance use, marijuana use is still significant across these grades. Um, over a quarter reported in 12th graders, 18% reported in 10th graders, and 8% reported already in 8th grade. Um, and then we also saw that new arrival of Delta 8. So just as a friendly reminder, that is a synthetic version of CBD. So um, it, it's like a chemically modified version of it. So it is synthetic, meaning we don't know what it does to the brain. We don't know what it does long term. Um, and despite that, we already have 11.4% of 12th graders reported that they were using it. Um, in all of this data, kind of the outcome that was suggested by NIDA was that you want to consider the cohort effect. So what we're seeing is that if you were in a cohort that had a significant increase in substance use, that trend seemed to continue on versus if you're in a cohort that had those lower levels that also continues on. So again, that initial starting and behaviors are really important over time. Um, we also noted that if you were able to abstain from using a substance in one year, it's actually likely you would continue to abstain from substance use. Next, I was wanting to look at what the statistics on pediatric deaths look like specific to overdoses. So this study that I looked at um, pulled a national data um, that was accumulated through the CDC and some surveys through epidemiological studies throughout the U.S. And what they did is they looked at the total overdose deaths in ages 14, 18 across the U.S. for every 100,000 compared to the average population to then um, calculate out odds ratios and kind of look at that risk. Um, they specifically looked at what drugs were related to those overdose deaths. And then they specifically sectored out what races um, or ethnicities were we seeing were maybe disproportionately impacted in these deaths as well. So what they found is that in 2019, there were 492 overdose deaths in this population. This increased in 2020 yet again. And in 2021, we saw over 1,000 overdose deaths. So that was 5.49 deaths per every 100,000. Um, and again, these are all adolescents. Uh, this was about a 94% increase in deaths from 2020 to 2021 alone. And unsurprisingly, fentanyl fatality had increased, as we saw in a correlation with this. Um, specific to overdose deaths relating to fentanyl, we saw that um, at 253, those deaths in 2019, 680 in 2020, and then 2021, 884 reported from fentanyl overdose deaths in those ages of 14 to 18. Fentanyl was found in about over 77% of those overdose cases, which compared to 13% relating to benzodiazepines. Lastly, I was really curious of how primary care providers and pediatricians felt in um, implementing brief screenings and then making referral processes for any concerns of addiction in adolescents. Um, I know qualitative studies aren't as rigorous, but sometimes I really do like to go back to the source and I like looking at quotes and to kind of get a feel of at the service level, how are providers feeling about being able to do this? I was able to find one qualitative study that surveyed 75 PCPs, which included MDs, NPs, and I think DOs in various um, clinics that worked with pediatric populations in urban settings. It unfortunately didn't specify where. Um, and in all of these PCP surveyed, a majority have reported that they would talk about substance use in their adolescents that they saw, and this included illicit use of substances. Um, almost all perceived barriers, though, in doing this and implementing brief screenings and then how to refer. The most common barriers that were reported was how do we separate kids from parents in these appointments so that they feel safe and have the privacy to discuss this? How do we implement this into our limited time or our workflow? And some also identified lacking resources. If, if you did find an issue, then what do you do next with that or where do you refer? What I underlined here is almost 50% reported not having any formal training on this process. Uh, these two graphs were provided um, by SAMHSA, which is really just looking at what is the percentage of those who have alcohol use disorder, marijuana use or cannabis use disorder, what percentage of those people started drinking at each of these ages? So what we're seeing is that almost 50% of those um, with alcohol use disorder reported having their first drink before age 13. And then almost at that rate at 45% had reported first drink at age 14. So really what we're finding here is that um, if you started drinking before age 13, you'd almost a 50% risk of later developing the alcohol use disorder. And then unfortunately there were similar trends found with marijuana use as well. 
And this graph kind of speaks to most substance use is going to start in that adolescence um, time period. So the most use being reported in ages 16 to 17, similarly around ages 18 to 20, which is how significantly I want everyone to note this drops off in young adulthood and being almost abysmal once we reach age 26. So really, if someone can abstain from using substances up until early in middle adulthood, um, really it's likely they won't use substances ever. So in summary, when we talk about statistics, overall adolescent substance use rates are down, luckily, and I think the quarantining from 2020 really contributed to that. Unfortunately, substance use is becoming more dangerous. So while we're using less substances, the substances that are being used are more dangerous and increasing risk of preventable overdose deaths. Um, primary care providers, I will continue to reiterate this throughout our presentation today, are at the forefront of primary prevention, um, but unfortunately don't always feel like they've received that training and how to implement this process. In general, the sooner substances are used, the more likely a later substance use disorder is to develop. So what, this is, again, why it's so important to be um, looking for this at this time in the lifespan and to be doing something about it. Um, and because preventing a sub uh, substance use just for one year in this population can be instrumental into preventing later substance use disorders. So next, I want to transition into neurobiology and how um, the different development, especially in the adolescent um, time of brain development, why this can relate so much to risk of trying substances and being at risk for substance use disorders. So this is a graph of neuron development um, or growth throughout brain development. And what we're seeing first is a picture at birth. We're not seeing as many neurons, and you know, we're just starting to form connections and our brain is developing. At age six, we see that blooming period where we have a whole lot of neurons connecting everywhere. Um, and I kind of think about this as the molding and resiliency period. And you kind of want to think about these young children who can learn languages fluently very quickly, um, how we feel like it's easier to learn a language at a younger age, for example. And at age 14, we start to see what's called pruning, where your brain is going to start to identify what neuronal connections are we making, what information are we using more of, and then we're going to start to make stronger connections there, and we're going to start to myelinate our brain tissue to make um, the neuronal connections more efficient and stronger. And so I kind of think of this as we're beginning to master and focus in on what our brain is using. Um, I think this also speaks to the concept of neuroplasticity, that being what you don't use, you lose, and also pointing out to how dangerous it can be then if you start using substances as a teenager, how much of it's really going to impact um, your later brain development. Which, uh, here's just another example of that. So this is an image of brain scans that was done looking at the amount of myelinated tissue or gray matter as the brain develops. So um, looking at how much is present to then track how much the brain has developed over time. So I want to point out that those lighter colors, the reds and the green, that's less development, whereas that darker blue is depictions of full development. Um, and yet, even at age 20, we're seeing there's still some of that green. So pointing out that at age 20, brains are still developing. And there is a rhyme and a reason to how our brain develops. Um, first, we start to see development in the cerebellum at the earliest ages. And this makes sense. We think about babies as they start getting up and crawling and moving and um, kind of being all over the place physically. Uh, then next, we have the development of the amygdala, which is our emotional control center, our fight or flight center, our ability to respond to stress. And you think about those preschoolers or what we might consider the terrible twos, uh, where out of nowhere, we can be thrown tantrums and out of nowhere, those can quickly resolve because that is a very real time um, example of that area of our brain developing. And then into childhood, we have the nucleus accumbens developing, which if you talk to anybody in the addiction world, we're going to talk a whole lot about the nucleus accumbens because we think about this as the center of our reward system. And this is the area of our brain that's really um, correlated to trying um, drugs and drug seeking based behaviors. This is the area of our brain where we learn things, we learn what feels good, and it can contribute to um, uh, continuing to engage in those behaviors. So not to give anybody flashbacks to their boards exams, but I kind of like to think of Erickson's stages of development when you think about children in their stages of industry versus inferiority and how at this age group, we, we really love feeling productive and getting rewarded for that. And then lastly, in adolescence, we see the prefrontal cortex developing. So our area of the brain that helps us make um, good decisions, think ahead of time and use impulsivity and judgment, um, that is starting to form. So this graph is going to zoom in on that concept then. So if you think about the nucleus accumbens, 
being our gas pedal, uh, where we want to think about things that feel good and natural rewards and pleasure seeking behaviors that is fully developed in the teenager. So gas pedal fully developed, whereas our prefrontal cortex, which we can think about as the brake pedal being the ability to use impulse control and sound decisions, um, that is still developing. This is an experiment that they did to further look at, okay, how do adolescent brains perceive rewards um, in comparison to child um, children's brains and then adult brains? So follow with me on here. But if you look, the blue line is going to look at children, the black line is looking at teenagers, and the green line is looking at adults. And what they did is they did brain scans to kind of look at the amount of brain activity that was occurring, first from a small stimulus or a small reward on the left, and then a larger stimulus or reward on the right, and then comparing to what brain activity in these age groups did. Um, if we look at the black line or the teenagers, it's actually kind of funny. It looks like a small reward was almost off-putting to their brains. And to put this into context, imagine telling a teenager they did a good job by giving them a sticker or a small pencil as a reward. Um, they might actually roll their eyes and think that's kind of lame. Whereas if we look over at what happened when they had a large reward, they responded more significantly than the children and the adult brains did. So just pointing out that their brains might be a bit more sensitive to that reward sensation. So in summary, when we talked about brain development, adolescent brains are greatly primed for larger reward-seeking behaviors, more so even than adults. Uh, adolescent brains respond more sensitively to rewards despite still developing in areas of judgment and long-term reasoning. And understandably, this would all increase vulnerability for high-risk behaviors, such as trying substances and then you know, being at greater risk for developing later disorders as adults. So this is a great time to transition to what are those most common substances that adolescents are using? And that is going to include tobacco products, cannabis products, and alcohol. This is a lovely depiction of an alcohol molecule. Um, not that anybody really wants to go into chemistry here, but it's just pointing out that it's somewhat similar to the water molecule. It is a very lipophilic chemical, which means that it can pass through barriers very easily and can bind to different things in the body. So it can have a lot of um, effects. And as we're aware, if you were to drink alcohol in an empty stomach or if it's swished around more in your mouth and in your gums, it could absorb more quickly and you might feel stronger effects of intoxication. This um, statistic is just noting that of anyone who's going to underage drink, so under age 21, that's usually going to occur in the context of binge drinking. Um, as a friendly reminder, binge drinking is defined as either four or more drinks in women or five or more drinks in men. So basically, anytime underage drinkers are drinking, it's usually in a more harmful, risky context. Here was a study that they did um, to specifically ask the question, does alcohol affect adolescent brains differently than adult brains? And what they did is they took two rats, they broke um, them into groups, the adult rats and the adolescent rats, and then they had some rats get placebo or saline, and then they had some rats get alcohol. And so they compared the adult rats who had been intoxicated with alcohol to the adolescent rats, and they had them swim this water channel maze to see if one was better able to reach the platform than the other, or if there was different impairments being noted in the adult versus the adolescent rats who were intoxicated with alcohol. And I'm not entirely sure how they did this in the methods. I would encourage you to look into that. I don't know if it was ethanol vapors or if they had them drink it somehow. But what they found is that the adult rats were a lot more slowed down and they struggled to get to the platform in the sense that they were a lot slower. Um, the adolescent rats similarly struggled to get to the platform, but it was in a different way. They were not at all slowed down from their intoxication. They were actually just really um, uncoordinated in their motor abilities. And the reason this matters is because I think we can see this play out in real time in different high-risk behaviors that adolescents might engage in despite being intoxicated with alcohol. And um, whether that's engaging in risky sexual behaviors or their impulsive things such as getting behind the wheel. And what this graph looked at was comparing um, adolescents and their um, their likelihood of car crashes, depending on how much alcohol was in their system. And obviously we saw greater car crashes with higher levels of alcohol, um, more so in teenagers than older groups here. But I think what this is speaking to is adolescents might just not feel that sense of impairment that they still are experiencing from alcohol. They might feel like they're more invincible than they actually are, which again explains why we're set up for such high risk behaviors. This is um, a picture of brain scans that looked at what does alcohol use do over time to the adolescent um, brain. And so we looked at a brain scan from age 16 to age 20 and a non-drinker and then compared that to a brain scan from age 16 and 20 
in a heavy drinker. And we can all kind of follow the trend here. More activation is noted by those bright colors, the red and the orange, with deactivation in the darker blue and the loss of those colors, which we certainly see more in the heavy drinker going from age 16 to 20. So just showing those um, deep implications on our brain if we're going to continue to engage in excessive alcohol use. Bridging next to nicotine, so here's just a picture of the nicotine molecule compared to our endogenous uh, acetylcholine uh, chemical. So nicotine is going to come into the brain and sit on those acetylcholine receptors, which just as a friendly reminder, is going to be our procognitive um, chemical in the brain. And this graph is just looking at what does use of tobacco products in high schoolers look like? And we're looking at this, it's a little outdated, but from different years. Um, if you'll recall back from my statistics slide, I pointed out that in 2018, we saw a three times increase in vaping, um, both in nicotine products and also in marijuana. And so if you look at the black line, this is showing what was happening in 2018. We had a significant increase in e-cigarette use among high schoolers, um, despite use of other products such as cigarettes actually being down. And this was actually when that Juul, as in J-U-U-L, the Juul product had come out um, that made e-cigarettes look uh, more inconspicuous and brightly colored. It, they looked like USB ports, to be honest, so probably easy to hide from parents and probably seemed more um, fun to use. And this was kind of just pointing out again that unfortunately that did seem to be targeting the teenage population. And as a response, we did see a whole lot more um, substance use happening with that. This is just showing a brain depiction of what is nicotine doing in the brain. Nicotine is going to come in and sit on those acetylcholine receptors. And if you follow the teal arrows sitting in the midbrain there, we're, we're living in that kind of addiction area of the brain that we might point out to. So that being our ventral mental area, um, where our, our uh, dopamine neurons are going to project over to the nucleus accumbens, which again, that being like a reward and pleasure seeking area of the brain and then projecting up to the prefrontal cortex and releasing dopamine. So again, that, that good feeling. And then also acting on things like glutamate, that procognitive kind of stimulating chemical in the brain and a little bit of GABA, which is that calming inhibitory chemical. So um, this is just pointing out that sense of the buzz people might describe, that those effects do project in the prefrontal cortex, which is concerning as that area is still developing in the adolescent brain. Um, and that buzz, nicotine acts very shortly. So really what this is saying that while there is that ability for an addiction, it's usually shorter lived. And this is why in theory, it feels that nicotine is less debilitating in comparison to other substances in the short term. This graph is showing a summary of adolescent um, effects of nicotine compared to how adults might experience the effects of nicotine. And in brief summary, adolescents are basically going to feel a lot more of the rewarding sensations, whereas adult brains are a lot more prone to the negative sensations that can happen from nicotine use. And this is a picture showing of all of the potentially harmful chemicals that are in e-cigarettes or vapes. Uh, if you ever have a patient come to you and say, well, this is my harm reduction, it's helping me stop smoking, or it doesn't have the cancer tar in it that cigarettes do. Um, unfortunately, we still see a lot of harmful chemicals in these products. You know, things like, you know, we've got eye irritants, but we also have something that's in water waste treatment. Uh, a chemical that looks like it's a part of volcanic emission, uh, some embalming fluid chemicals, and um, specifically just things that can be poisonous. Okay, so um, just to recap briefly, we talked about how alcohol is usually used in the context of binges in adolescence and um, how damaging that can be on brain development over time. We talked about how alcohol does affect the adolescent brain differently, and they seem to be less prone to impairing effects, and they have more of those feel-good effects. And that is a similar phenomenon being described in how nicotine affects the adolescent brain as well, which is going to look different than the adult brain. Um, and is also concerning because there are effects going into the prefrontal cortex with nicotine use that is still developing in the teenager. Um, we talked about how the e-cigarette development led to an increase of use with that product and how those are still harmful products that um, can have harmful chemicals in them. So lastly, as we close out on talking about different substances adolescents are using, I want to make sure we take a step to specifically talk a bit more about cannabis. Here's a depiction of a THC molecule in um, comparison to our endogenous chemical in atomide. So THC is going to go into the brain, and I know we call them um, CV receptors, but really it's probably because we didn't discover anatomide yet. So T 
THC is going to go in and sit on our anatomine receptors in our brain. And so we do not have endogenous um, receptors for THC. We have receptors in our brain for anatomide. And just to be clear too, um, the way the cannabis affects the brain is it actually is going to function almost like a middleman and affect how neurotransmitters are going to release or communicate. Um, usually if a neurotransmitter sits on a receptor, it's going to cause the neuron to then release additional neurotransmitters and that's going to go down the line. Um, cannabis actually will function in more of a retrograde fashion where it'll sit on these receptors and actually a slow neuronal activity down. So overall, I think of it as almost like inhibitory response in the brain. And I also want to remind everybody in very late terms, if we're going to break down the cannabis plant and think about what chemicals in there, when we talk about substance use that we really want to focus on, that's going to come down to CBD versus THC. Um, obviously, there's a whole lot of other chemicals in the cannabis plant, um, but when we talk about different substances being used, we want to think about the differences in CBD versus THC. Um, CBD overall is going to be more of that anti-anxiety, anti-pain, um, calming sort of effect of the cannabis. And it actually can be mitigative to some potentially psychoactive and harmful components of THC. Um, THC on the flip side is actually going to be more that psychoactive and potentially harmful substance in high quantities can actually create neurotoxic effects and even things like psychosis, which we will go into a bit more here. So this is an image showing exactly what THC is doing in the brain and where it is impacting things in the brain when it is um, taken into the system. So first, I want everyone to focus in on the midbrain area again. So that, that kind of addiction center we've been talking about and that purple line you're seeing is showing the ventral tegmental area, um, the dopamine receptors that are then going to project up to the nucleus accumbens, which, as I've said so many times this presentation, is where our behaviors related to addiction really live. That's where we get that dopamine release and feel good sensation that can really lead to repetitive behaviors that we see in SCDs. And so for anyone who says that THC is not addictive, that just objectively is not correct. Um, looking at what's happening in the brain, THC is absolutely a substance that you can become addicted to. Um, it also will have a bunch of effects in the cerebrum and over in the prefrontal cortex, which you think about someone who's used a lot of cannabis and they might have slowed down thinking or they, their processes seem to slow down and it might make sense then as it's affecting this area of the brain, why that might be happening. We also see a lot of impacts at the cerebellum. So I kind of think about how those physical slow down impairments we might see as well, like lacking motor coordination, um, things like that. And this is specifically speaking to reductions in the hippocampus and damage we see to the hippocampus as it correlates to the amount of cannabis being ingested. So if you look at the y-axis, this is showing with the more joints or the more cannabis we're ingesting, this is going to negatively correlate with the size of our hippocampal volume. Um, so really this correlation of the more we're taking in, the more damage and shrinking really we're seeing at the hippocampus which is really concerning because the hippocampus, again, that's our area of not just memory, um, but learning and how we learn to uh, process emotions, which um, I probably wouldn't want my learning area in adolescence to be uh, shrinking. And that can speak a lot to what later learning and development can do to a brain going to adulthood. This is a study that was done back in 2012 that I find equally interesting and concerning. So this looked at the amount of cannabis use in cohorts. They followed these cohorts for 25 years um, and they divided them into groups and they repeatedly followed up on what their IQ scores were doing. So first we looked at a group who had never used any cannabis. And then we looked at a group that had used but had never been diagnosed with a cannabis use disorder. So again, just using that to gauge that cannabis use must have been significant enough to have that diagnosed disorder. And then following those who had that um, diagnosis continued for one year, two years, or for three or more years. And what they found is that our IQ scores were negatively impacted over time by the amount of cannabis that we were likely consuming. So the only positive correlation we're seeing in those who didn't use any, and then we see significant more impairments as we engage in longer use. Um, we saw a drop in IQ scores by six points in those who had um, continued to meet that criteria for cannabis use disorder for at least three years. Um, six points might not seem like a lot, but I think this specifically and objectively would point to the neurotoxicity over time of cannabis use. And Boston Children's Hospital did a study of their own as well, where they recruited 500 adolescents in primary care settings, and they had them report if they'd experienced any of these symptoms while using cannabis. And 27% of those 500 had reported experiencing some form of hallucinations, 
33, a little over 33% had some form of paranoia or anxiety. And really concerningly, almost 50% had experienced some form of psychotic symptom. So not only are we seeing these really strong correlations with cannabis use and um, brain development damage really, but we're also seeing a strong correlation with acute psychiatric outcomes as well. And really simply, that's because um, it's really important to know, and I'm sure everyone's aware of this by now, but this is not this is not your parents' cannabis or what people used to smoke way back in the day, right? Um, the cannabis plant has changed so much over time, and I believe as it's become, unfortunately, a bit of a profit machine and something that's been very highly marketed and pushed, um, it's been changed. And there's always been this push for more THC content and more potency in the product. And so if you go to a dispensary in Colorado, you'll look at, they talk about different forms of cannabis, whether it's the sativa versus the indica strains. And really what they're pointing out is how much CBD or the calming effect of the plant is in, in this product versus the psychoactive THC um, type of plant. And then what happened is they started farming these plants excessively and trying to um, rebreed plants who might have more THC versus having more CBD. But what's happening over time is as they've created these hybrid plants, it's really become unpredictable in how much THC is going to be in that strain of plant. So if you ever have a person come up to you and say, I know my cannabis products are um, natural and they can be trusted, there's just no way to know in this day and age of really what their cannabis product is looking like. And I also wanna point out these images I put up here. This is all technically what falls under that category marijuana, which I know it doesn't look like marijuana, right? So that left picture is a depiction of oil, and that is going to be that really concentrated cannabis oil that's going to have a lot of THC in it. So whenever I say really concentrated, I am specifically referring to the percent of THC in the product. Um, that middle picture is going to be cannabis wax, also a higher potency product with a lot of THC. And the picture on the right is going to be an example of cannabis butter. Um, if we look at what's happened to cannabis over time, we see that on average, the percentage of THC in cannabis in the 90s was about 15%. This increased 80 times in 2020 with um, the increased use of what are called DAP pens. So DAP pens are usually going to have a lot of that really high potency THC oil in them, which is going to have upwards of 90% of it is going to have THC. Some of it even boasted 99%. Um, and then what I did is I was really curious when I was working as an inpatient nurse, I originally went into practice with this idea that cannabis was just cannabis. Um, that was that, I didn't think much of it. And I saw this really alarming trend happening where I was seeing a lot of teenagers as young as 15 and on the young adult unit, so up to ages in the 20s, coming in floridly psychotic. And we would always do urine drug screens. And I remember the only thing that would show a positive was cannabis. And I had thought, you know, is it laced? Is it something else? And I remember a psychiatrist first pulling me aside and saying, it's about the amount of THC. It's about the percentage in the product that can really create outcomes like this. So I ended up looking into this study um, and this is a case. So these pie charts are showing the outcomes of a case control study that looked at 11 sites in Europe where they looked at any incidents of first episode psychosis that had happened um, in their hospital systems. And then they divided those episodes into groups. So those who had been using cannabis and looking at the potency of their products compared to those who had not. And then they compared it to um a relative uh, similar or the normal population, as you will, to calculate out odds ratios and determine by regions regions that had more cannabis use or higher potency products, what was that risk that um, an episode of psychosis in these regions would pertain to cannabis use? And in London, we saw a five times increased risk um, of having some form of psychosis related to cannabis use in that region. And in Amsterdam, we saw nine times um, risk of cannabis use relating to an episode of psychosis. So we were seeing this happening. Um, there was a 30% chance in London it would relate to cannabis if someone had a psychotic episode in Amsterdam, there's a 50% chance risk that if someone was using cannabis, they would have a psychotic episode. And Amsterdam, again, was going to be a region that had the most cannabis being used and the most um, high potency products being used. So again, just speaking a whole bunch about that correlation of how much THC is in the product and the potency can correlate so strongly with these acute psychiatric outcomes. So if we're going to talk um, a lot about THC and knowing that THC in high amounts can be harmful, well then, 
what are supposed to be the recommendations? What are going to be those toxic doses? And what, what's going to be a safe dose? And the short answer is we don't know. So if anyone ever asks you that question, make sure you tell them there are lacking studies and we don't know long-term what this will do to your brain. Um, but what we do know for sure is that the longer you use a product with a lot of THC in it, the more you are very much at risk for a cannabis use disorder or addiction. Um, and the more you're at risk for these negative outcomes that we talked about, such as harms in brain development and also things like psychosis. And so what I did is I looked at Minnesota because they're being our neighboring state and that they just legalized cannabis. I was curious what the Minnesota Department of Health recommended for, you know, general guidelines, whether it's for recreational use or if we're going to use it for chronic pain. I have patients in the addiction clinic come in very often saying that they want to continue using their cannabis because it helps with anxiety, sleep, pain, you name it. Um, and according to their website where they go and cite all these different studies where they correlate their recommendations, the general guideline is that you don't want to exceed 40 milligrams a day of THC. The general guideline for CBD is going to be a lot higher, um, even upwards of 800 milligrams. And that's because a lot of studies have seen that people can ingest a lot of um, cannabis and they don't really, sorry, um, CBD, and they're not really seeing those negative side effects. For chronic pain, and I italicize this, the recommendation is you want the product to be CBD predominant, um, or if you're going to add THC, it's going to be really low levels with a max of 40 milligrams. And in general, you want the product to be a one-to-one -one ratio from THC to CBD. And I, again, I want to remind you, CBD has a lot of those mitigative effects on negative side effects of THC. Um, toxic doses of THC. So again, this is all correlation and not causation, right? But um, Dr. Andrea Weber, my, one of my attendings, did a lovely lecture on cannabis recently, and she told me about this meta-analysis she looked at, which I referenced below, that was done in Australia. So again, studies are lacking in the U.S., but what they found in pooling all these studies together is that at doses as low as above 7 milligrams of THC, there were reports of dizziness, headache, and nausea. Um, at doses as low as 30 milligrams of THC, we we're seeing loss coordination and altered perceptions being reported. And then anyone who's naive to using cannabis, there, there's possible intoxication that can happen at a dose of 10 milligrams. So again, keeping that 30 and 40 milligrams in your head of THC recommendation. Because next, um, you kind of want to ask yourself, well, then how much of your patient, how much is your patient ingesting? How much THC are they potentially getting in their product? And I had to do a lot of looking at different um, recreational websites and things to find this information. So my search history probably doesn't look great, but um, here's what I ended up finding in my accumulation of search, um, searching uh, in general, a one mil cart. Um, so if we're talking about a vape with a cart, it's going to have potentially up to 1000 milligrams of cannabis. That is not a realistic amount or size vape that most teenagers are probably going to use. And lovely teenagers I've worked with have told me this. Um, it's a lot more common that they're going to use that half gram dab, which is going to have the 500 milligrams of cannabis in it. But that's just of the cannabis. To determine how much THC they could be taking in, you next need to take the percentage of how much THC is um being advertised in that product. So if it's a dab pen, let's remember that that tends to have more of that oil, that really high potency um, THC in it that could be upwards of 60 to 90% THC. So if someone is going through a whole cart of a half dab pen, that means that in whatever time they do that, they could be taking in 300 milligrams of THC, which is a bit different than 40 milligrams. Um, if someone says they're smoking a bowl, this would be um, equivalent to about 0.5 grams or 500 milligrams of cannabis. And let's just be conservative and assume that's 15% of it is THC. Well, then you would have ingested 37 to 75 milligrams of THC in that time. However, it's a, if it's a higher potency product that's 60 to 90% concentrated with THC, you could also be, you could be taking it up to 150. Um, in general, if you vape over smoke, it's going to be more potent. You're going to get more of it into your brain. Um, Delta 8 is going to advertise that it's 25 to 50 milligrams of THC, but I kind of think that doesn't mean much because in general, it's a synthetic product. And I've also seen people have acute psychotic reactions to it at very low doses because again, it's synthetic. We don't know what it's going to do to the brain. Here's a quick picture of some cannabis products I saw being advertised in one of the Minnesota dispensaries, and these are edibles. Um, I want everyone to focus in on these chocolate pieces that on the package says that there's 500 milligrams of THC in each half of a square. So a lot of these are really misleading and confusing because if you break off a piece of chocolate, you'd probably assume like me, the dose would be the full chocolate square. And what this product is saying that it's actually half of it is going to have that amount. And then if you look on the left, this edible is showing that each piece is going to have 10 milligrams of THC in it, which if we remember, if you're naive to cannabis, that's enough to make you feel pretty intoxicated, according to studies. Um, and unfortunately, there was really negative outcomes that were happening in Colorado of people who would go up to Colorado and not having had used cannabis 
and wanting to dabble in all these products and trying edibles and not following dosing recommendations and having acute, um, really negative reactions to it. Uh, so in summary, I know we talked a whole lot about cannabis. I want, just as a summary, everyone to consider this friendly handout as a brief intervention tool. Um, I want to clarify that I did not get this vetted through the university. So technically, I cannot promote that you print it off and use it. But it, it's just a nice, friendly image. You can refer back to my slides. It kind of consolidates everything we talked about, which that image at the top is just talking about those different doses of THC and different outcomes we know to be true from different studies. And that anything over that 40 milligrams or that potentially harmful dose over over time, we have seen a variety of negative outcomes, which has included, you know, through vaping or smoking, there's been those images of popcorn lung that they um, talked about. There's that very real risk of psychosis. We talked about the shrinking hippocampus and areas of the brain. Um, there's also something called hyper, um, cannabis hyperemesis syndrome, which is where if you have really toxic um, doses of THC, you can have cyclic, cyclic uncontrollable ongoing vomiting, um, where I have seen this come into the children's hospital, actually, and it, it doesn't respond to medications. And um, don't forget to ask about if they're smoking a lot of cannabis, because that's definitely something that can occur from that. And I love to tell my teenage um, boys about the potential outcome that's been found of testicular atrophy with a lot of cannabis use, including low sperm count, because they seem very motivated by that information. Um, and then I also kind of consolidated, you know, the different products and what are the amounts of THC we might see in those products with a few of those facts. So again, I always like to tell teens when I have this discussion with them, I, that I am empowering them, that um, what kind of cannabis are you using? And I think it's your right to know, especially if you're giving up your money to this, if you have a potentially harmful or a less harmful product. Recommendation across the board is going to be try not to use it. We know that there's really harmful outcomes to your brain, but if you're going to use it, probably try to find a way to reduce your THC amount. Um, we know long term it's absolutely neurotoxic. Okay, um, so now we're going to kind of finish um, our presentation on talking about assessment and referrals for treatment. So this is an image of um, what the American Academy of Pediatrics is recommending, and that is that we want to be implementing what's called SBIRT into different treatment settings. It's, it's a process that can be standardized um, because it's very evidence-based and has been found to be very effective. So I'll explain more about SBIRT in a second, but that is going to be our screening for brief intervention and referral to treatment of doing that screening process of potential substance use and if there's any high-risk use or concerns for disorders. Um, the general recommendation across the board is that the non-use message should be reinforced Forced, um, through clear and consistent information that you can present not only to patients, but parents and family members. Um, there are studies, and I put this on the bottom of in my notes section, that reference some really good outcomes they've seen. There was a primary care setting that first implemented this to see would teenagers be open and would they talk about their substance use? And their overall finding was yes. Um, teenagers were more open and comfortable talking about it than they had realized. Um, there was another study in an ER where they implemented a brief intervention and screening for risky alcohol use. So any teenagers who were coming in in a, a vehicle crash or injury related to drinking, they would give them a brief intervention about it. And they found at about, I think it was a month follow up, there was a significant reduction in um, additional incidents of it happening. However, longer term, at uh, three months or more follow-up, those um, outcomes seem to drop off. So really, I think SBIRT is a, a really effective tool to prevent risky use and help um, teenagers abstain from higher risk substance use. It's just that over time, if there's a lot of significant use happening, that's where I think it speaks to. We really want to get them referred into treatment and to get them into appropriate treatment settings for ongoing treatment. So again, here is that um, acronym of SBIRT, and I kind of spaced it out so you can visualize that standing for that first step of screening and then a brief intervention and then a referral to treatment, depending on what you're finding. And this is going to happen kind of in a step-by-step -step fashion. Um, it, it's appearing more complicated than it is. A lot of you are probably doing this without realizing it with your PHQ-2s or PHQ-9s. So that's the idea of that you're going to implement a brief screening tool standardized across the board. So anyone by a certain age group, um, in general, we want to be screening all adolescents for any substance use. And then you're going to look at that screening result and determine, is there a risk or anything concerning happening based off of what they report? That's where you're going to tailor your brief intervention, um, which might include a referral to treatment. So step by step, here's what this would look like. Um, first, we want to screen. I want to introduce everyone to this brief screening tool um, that I not only think is really easy and simple to use, but it's easy to score. And I think that matters a lot to clinicians who might not have a whole lot of time in clinic to sit through and score um, screening tools. So for each substance, they go in and select how often they're using it. And then next, you want to look at that and determine, okay, what is that risk level? And this is just showing how we score it. So if they're reporting never use, 
really low risk of an SUD once or twice, maybe there's a low risk of something going on. Any consistent use monthly or weekly of any of these substances, there's a high risk there can be a substance use disorder happening. And then we want to, you know, more proactively intervene on that. I want to briefly remind everyone of what is that definition? How do we diagnose someone with a substance use disorder? I am not assuming anybody is going to remember the DSM criteria with all the 11 criteria for um, uh, SUD diagnosis, but um, a quick way to remember this is by the C's. Literature might talk about the four C's. I personally like to talk about the five C's, and that's because I really think we need to talk first about is there consistent use? That first C being consistency, and I think that's what that brief screening tool points out with are you consistently using any of these substances? Because if so, there's a real risk there could be a problem. Next, you wanna think about cravings or thinking about using the substance a lot or thinking about how to obtain the substance. Then there's that control piece. Have you been using more than you meant to over time? Is it escalating? And then those last two really going hand in hand of, is there that compulsive return to using despite all these consequences that are happening from your use? Um, so then with your interventions, this is what that might look like. If there's complete abstinence, denial of substance use, you're going to positively reinforce. Um, great job not using substances. You're making really good decisions. Um, I'm so glad you're not using substances. Then there's going to be that brief intervention, um, brief health advice if there is some substance use, but without a disorder. Um, I want to remind everyone that potential harmful use does not equate to, to a substance use disorder, but we should still intervene if there's something really risky happening. So if a teenager tells me I tried fentanyl once, I'm going to be really worried about that. Um, it doesn't mean that we meet criteria for a use disorder, but it definitely means we should be, be intervening. So asking, you know, is this something you want to continue using? Do you know that there's risk of even like overdose and death? Um, is there any way I can help you with this? That sort of thing. And then if there's anyone who screens at a potential risk for a substance use disorder, we want to have that brief intervention again, offering information. Sometimes it's something like, you know, I'm so glad you told me about this, but I have to tell you as your provider, I'm worried about you. I'm worried about all these negative things I know can happen from this. Um, here's what I recommend. But there's people who specialize in this and places that might be really helpful for you. Would you be okay with me referring you to those places? And then that's where the referral to treatment might happen. As a reminder, teenagers do have a legal right to consent to and privately discuss substance use um, related information as well as treatment decisions. So technically a teenager can consent to addiction treatment with how guardian um, consent. So I have had teenagers that have been started on naltrexone or things. And I, I also had a teenager who was started on Suboxone and that was through their right that they didn't need a guardian consent for. That is their own private information. That said, I always like to have a discussion with teenagers of, hey, if you're telling me you're doing something really risky or harmful to you, and or if it's directly involving you know, family life or if it's unavoidable, they're going to find out, let's tell your parents, but let's talk about how to do that together. These are brief case scenarios. We're not gonna have time to really go through in depth, but I just wanna pose these examples that I've seen at consult service and that you could certainly run into. Um, the 12 year old who might tell you that they tried drinking once, um, never again. It's just that a lot of their friends are older and they drink a lot. Um, so for this patient, I am really concerned about their friend group. And often with teenagers, I'm going to ask if they say they're not using substances. Well, do your teenagers ever smoke weed or drink? Um, and then what I want to follow that up right away with, do you ever get into a car with them? And we'll talk more about that in a moment. 14-year-old um, whose urine drug screen comes back positive for THC, please investigate that. We don't have enough information. We don't know if that even meets the first C of consistent use because um, drug screens aren't really going to tell you all that much. So just know that sometimes there's um, unclear outcomes and you have to know if you're ever going to screen an adolescent what to do with that information. I provided in my notes a link to the American Academy of, um, um, I'm sorry, the AMA has a whole section about um, drug screening and adolescent populations, what to do with that, what the recommendations are, um, and different ways to go about that, which I don't have time to go into here. Um, but I found I have a direct quote in there. Um, of how they talk to talk about going about that. And I find that whole page I put in the link in there for very helpful. Um, for the 16 year old who might admit that yes, they started smoking perks as in Percocets, which we know are full of fentanyl. Um, they started using from their friends. They stole money from their mom to buy more and they're worried about getting their car taken away when she finds out. Clearly we have um, what sounds like consistent use. So that first C, we don't know about cravings because we didn't ask, um, and, but it sounds like we have a lot of compulsive return to use despite consequences here. So. This person likely has a substance use disorder of a very high risk substance where I would want to be referring to treatment. 
Here is a tool I want everybody to know about and take away today if ever interested. And I provided the link for this as well. This is the contract for life um, that you can give to a teenager. So anytime they're, if they say they're not using, fine. But if they ever say they're hanging out with a peer group who uses substances, I'm always worried about them getting into a vehicle with them um, that could be life threatening. And so this is a contract that you can give them and say that it's it's like a pledge. They're saying I pledge to try not to be in this situation or get into a car with someone who is intoxicated. But if I am, here is going to be my one safe adult I'm going to choose to reach out to without questions or reprimand who's going to come and get me. Um, and this can be a really powerful tool that was found to actually really reduce um, negative and life-threatening outcomes from these types of injuries. Here was just a quick accumulation of those education tools. I'm all about quick images and handouts. I do this a lot in consult service where I do a lot of brief interventions and sometimes it's showing pictures and you know, did you know how much you're drinking? Do you know this is a standard drink? Do you know if you're telling me that you and your friend are both pulling from a bottle and you can go through a liter together, that means you've had this many shots. Do you know that that's, that's this much more than like what's recommended for drinking and that that's over binge drinking? And over time, that can damage your liver and even lead to like risk of liver cancer and death. It's amazing how many teenagers do not know about the outcomes of liver disease and excessive drinking. And it's really sad, but on consult service, I have seen people in their young 30s who are already having that discussion of shortened lifespans from severe liver disease from drinking. Um, and then lastly, here's a depiction of that lovely uh, THC picture talking about, you know, negative outcomes from that. There's popcorn lung if we're smoking, brain shrink. We talked about um, hippocampal volume decrease, risk of psychosis, and then testicular atrophy that can happen from excessive use as well. Um, and brief accumulation here of interventions. So across the board for all substances being used, we're probably going to recommend dual treatment. So that's going to include some form of therapy programming that will pertain to substance use and mental health needs. Um, that's pretty evidence-based and high yield across the board. Um, for cannabis, if someone's having substance-induced um, psychosis from cannabis, then they might need inpatient psychiatric treatment and a short trial of a short um, second-generation antipsychotic. Or if someone is engaging a really high-risk fentanyl or opiate use, then it's where we can't stop running from home. And if, if I'm in this environment, I'm going to continue using and I'm at risk of overdose and death. They might need more of a residential or inpatient level treatment. Um, across the board, family therapy has a really high level of evidence. Um, the most evidence being for something called multisystemic therapy, which is specific for adolescents who have substance use disorders and potential involvement in the legal system. This is a type of therapy that is here in Iowa that um, will partner with not only families, but the individual adolescent for their use disorder. And then here's medications we can offer for these um, substances. Alcohol, we can absolutely give naltrexone as um, a medication for alcohol use disorder to help prevent heavy days of drinking and return to drinking. It's got moderate levels of evidence for that. I have had to put a few teenagers on naltrexone with kind of mixed results. Um, in adults, we have kind of our second line medication at Campus 8, which has a lot of lacking evidence for teenagers. But technically, you could use this for alcohol use disorder as well. It's got moderate to lower level of evidence. Cannabis, there's not really a great medicine to help with cravings or return to use. But in theory, there was a lower um, level evidence. There was like a cohort study that was done in adolescents that found that acetylcysteine or that anecdote to Tylenol could potentially be helpful in cravings and prevent return to use of cannabis. Um, for nicotine, you can absolutely give teenagers nicotine replacement patches or gum. And in theory, you could do Wellbutrin. We give teenagers will be turned opt in for ADHD or depression combinations, but in theory, you could do it for nicotine cessation. There's just less studies, obviously, in this population in general on that. And then for opioids, we have the strongest level of evidence for medications. Suboxone, I want to reiterate, is FDA approved for ages 16 and up. That is high level evidence, first level of medication treatment for opioid use disorder. It's a partial agonist, so there's less risk of that respiratory depression, so it's not a full opioid type medication, it's got a ceiling effect. Um, methadone technically has high evidence to use. However, it's really limited in being able to get this to someone under 18. Naltrexone would probably be your second line, which can be used for opioid use disorder as well to block those opioid receptors in the brain, has moderate to high evidence of use in adolescents for this. Um, there's always the option to consult our addiction medicine um, consult service. And then you can also refer for a second opinion or transfer treatment to our MAC clinic. As I said, I've had a few teenagers in my um, panel. And so I'm just going to leave you all with these resources so you know where to refer or who you can reach out to. Here's our flyer of our MAC clinic here at the University of Iowa. We take self-referrals. Here's our phone number. And um, we are no longer located in Boyd Tower. We are now in 1JPP, uh, right across from the adult site clinic um, in the white, through the white door there. So by elevator I on the first floor. 
Um, I want to tell everybody about the SUP program. This is a dual mental health and SUD intensive outpatient program that's in Cedar Rapids through ASAC. Um, they said absolutely they have openings. They're happy to take referrals. To do that, you just contact um, their lead counselor here, David Robinson. And I also want everyone to be aware of the Never Use Alone line. This is the line you can call. So if anyone's going to return to use of something of a substance that could risk a lethal overdose, you can call this line. So even if you're using alone, you can call and have someone stay on the line with you. So if you did overdose and stop responding, they can call 911 and get you help. We also have a mat walking clinic in um, Iowa City. So it's like our urgent care for any addiction needs. Open every Wednesday from one to four. We have had teenagers come in, sometimes with parents, sometimes without. This is a great way to get access into any addiction um, treatment or needs or into our mat clinic. And then if you're in-house, here's how you can place that um, referral. So if you just type in addiction in your order set, you see that second one there is the outpatient consult psychiatry addiction medicine. This is sometimes how I've had teenagers referred to me into my MAC clinic or just seen for a second opinion or evaluation. Here are my references if anyone is interested. And um, I also provided the link for the Addiction Recovery Collaborative website here at Iowa. And um, lastly, I did put my email and phone number on here if anyone wants to contact me as well. And I want to thank everybody for, I know that was a lot of information. I am now happy to, I know we ran a little long, but um, I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, well, thank you so much for such an informative presentation. Um, and, you know, we will send a, a handout of the slides so that you'll have that information for reference. Um, let's dive right into questions. Um, one that was submitted is, can you speak to ADHD and substance use risk? Oh, absolutely. Um, there is a known, known correlation and increased risk of those who have ADHD. So when we look at adults who have ADHD, um, we see a much larger percentage of them also end up having co-occurring substance use disorders. Um, I don't know how much I would, I would probably suggest someone look into some retrospective studies would probably be really fruitful, but just on my panel in the MAC clinic, I cannot tell you how many adults I see who have ADHD disorders, either undiagnosed or they were treated and then they were untreated. Um, ADHD can be so debilitating in the sense that it's going to um, worsen our ability to, you know, it like makes us more prone to impulsive decisions and potentially engaging in these risky behaviors. Sometimes I also have adults I'm seeing here in Iowa who, you know, meth use is really significant in this state who start self-medicating with meth because they stopped, um, but whether they were lost to treatment follow-up or they lost access to treatment and they just felt like they had to self-medicate to be able to stay on track and go to work and things like that. So I am all about um, really pushing the adolescent population. It's always better we treat ADHD and it's actually a lower risk for those adolescents to misuse or ADHD medications or to you know form an addiction to the medicine because really it's probably more so going to help them and actually be protective from them engaging in later um, substance use and high-risk behaviors. Okay, thank you. Um, are you aware of any treatment resources in the Des Moines metro area? And this is something we can also share some resources later if there's. Um, I am not, I won't be able to stay on the top of my head, but I do know that they have areas for SUD treatment. Um, I can't speak specifically for adolescents though. I would imagine there's got to be, I mean, it's a pretty, it's a bigger city area. And I, I have seen a few adolescents in clinic who did originally see people there. I don't know if that was a specialty clinic. Um, I'm happy to reach out to some of my colleagues and see if we have specific information on that, that we could share later, but off at the top of my head, I'm not sure. Thank you. Um, so many teenagers dabble in marijuana use. When does it need to be treated? And is it, um, a gateway drug? Yeah. Um, what's really interesting is that a lot of the adolescents I work with in the SED program, a lot of them actually come in court ordered and pretty severely into their use. And they will actually actively tell you, my cannabis is a problem. My cannabis has messed with my brain, or I think it made me dumb. Um, and I've also had them all agree, yes, I I started using other stuff because it started with cannabis and I've seen that across the board. I haven't just seen that here in Iowa, but I also saw that in Minnesota. It is absolutely a gateway drug. Um, and you know, when is it a problem? It's really hard sometimes to gauge a cannabis use disorder in teenagers because 
again, they might default to, it makes me feel better. I take it because it helps my sleep. It helps my anxiety. Um, it's a natural plant, right? So a way to kind of go around this and a way to really think about this with any substance you talk about is asking the teenager what they're doing. What do they usually do for fun? Um, what are things they enjoy? Are they in a sport? Do they go out and hang out with friends, right? Has any of those activities changed? Have, you know, have our grades, did they used to be good? And now are they slipping? Are we missing class? Because, you know, we were too high to think or, you know, are they reporting like, I just can't function if I'm not smoking my, my weed or whatever it is. Something else I like to ask them is what kind of product are you using? And they might say, what do you mean? And then I might ask, is it a dab pen? Is, do you know how much THC is in it? Is it like more potent? Is it oil, wax? So again, those higher potent products. And if they say yes, then ask them, did, did you start using that product or did you end up like, did you start with something else? And now you've kind of progressed to this because actually what you're teasing out is have they unintentionally been seeking out more and more THC and what you'll find. And what I find in a lot of teens is they actually, they do, they start with maybe just like your standard cannabis, whether they're like sharing a bowl with a friend or vaping. And then they notice that they're kind of looking for that higher, higher potency product. And without realizing it, really they're craving that substance that is very actively working in that addiction part of their brain. So I would say that right there would be a use disorder. And if it's ever preventing functioning or affecting school or affecting relationships, I would say that's problematic and should, you know, some form of treatment should be investigated for that. Okay. Thank you. Um, maybe we'll do one more um, before we have some, have a few closing announcements. Um, have you seen a heightened abuse in the transgender LGBTQ plus community? In substance use? In substance use. Hi a heightened substance use in tr the transgender. Yeah. So to be honest, and I just think this speaks to the lack of services for this population. I have not personally seen that population come into my clinic or really in that Cedar Rapids um, program I'm talking about. However, I did when I was looking at statistics and you can see this in my notes as well. There were two studies done that specifically asked that question. Are we seeing greater risk or um, frequency or amount of substance use in um, the transgender populations or those that are sexual minority populations, right? Um, or, you know, are not heterosexual, if you will. And yes, I think one of the studies noted that compared to the average population that might say like 18% are using cannabis, they might have in that population about 43% were using cannabis. Um, and there was also a study that specifically looked at that on top of if you were in a foster care system, exponential increase in the amount of substance that was being used. I think the fact that we don't know speaks to the lack of you know looking at this population and thinking about them. And I also think the lack of me seeing it again just speaks to barriers to them receiving treatment for it. All right. Thank you. And there was one comment that the Clive Behavioral Health, which is affiliated with Mercy, has uh, child and adolescent services, which do include substance use disorder to, to their knowledge. So that was, I think, in response to the uh, Des Moines area resources. Um, awesome. And so we'll just close with a couple of announcements. Um, the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine is jointly accredited to provide continuing education for physicians, nurses, social workers, and physician associates. All, all other participants will receive a certificate of participation. Um, attendees are eligible to claim continuing education by completing the evaluation and downloading their certificate of participation. Um, for DEA registrants, credits earned from this course may be used towards fulfillment of um, MATE Act's one-time training requirement for eight hours of accredited training related to the treatment of treatment and management of uh, patients with opioid or other substance use disorders. Um, you will need to retain the flyer for this event um, along with your certificate for tracking um, purposes. And I'll include this also in the follow-up email. Um, the step-by-step -step instructions um, were included as a handout in the chat. And again, I'll also just send this information in the follow-up email. Um, and if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me um, at coffee, K-A-F-I hyphen D-I-X-O-N at uiowa.edu. And so with that, I'll thank everyone for attending and um, and thank you, Dr. Stalmakoff, for a wonderful presentation. Thank you as well. Take care, everyone.